Welcome to another episode, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, here with Rich Klein. We're going to discuss then and now 9-11. As you can see from the show notes, somber topic. Some of you remember pre-2001, and some of you may may not. But we're going to talk about the way it was and the way it is now and how it impacted us personally as well as the company and the industry. Uh, but first, a thank you to our sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Panini, Tops, and Upper Deck. I would say each one of them probably also was impacted, although not ComC, maybe Tim Getch, personally, Abel. from being around, but... Tom C. was six years but from creation from at that creation, point. From creation, but was, uh, uh, any rate, it, it impacted our culture. It impacted us personally as well as uh, corporately. Rich, you were there. In fact, you were there there. I was in Dallas. I remember exactly where I was. But, uh, again, welcome, Rich. And, and uh, where were you? Because I've got a feeling you were uh, uh, closer to the flame. I was really close to the plane. I was up visiting my dad after spending my friend Teddy Straka, who was one of our New York Cagra of regional correspondence had gotten married on Sunday before the national, before, not the national, before 9-11. <clears throat> and I was staying a couple extra days in town because I was going to go to the Tuesday night Parsippany show and flying out of Newark Airport at 7 p.m. So before I started on my final day in New Jersey, I took my dad to Pathmark Supermarket in Elmwood Park, New Jersey. And on the way back, I heard, and I don't, and I never remember if it was Harry Harrison or Dan Daniel on CBS FM, talking about a building has just hit the World Trade Center. And my first reaction was, that reminds me of 1945, when the plane lost direction and hit the Empire State Building. By the time we got home, about 15 minutes later, the second plane was just about to hit, and we realized something much more was going on. And when I got home, we also only had one TV station. We didn't have cable or any other thing at the time. The only TV station we had was Channel 2, CBS. So it was scary on many levels, because we're being attacked, We've lost, you know, media communication in our home. We still had our phone, yeah. but it's, it's a hard situation because the first very, thing any terrorist does, grab the media centers. Right. Well, it was very confusing, confusing, making sense of it. The person uh, that really took charge in a very positive way at our company was Mark Harwell, who I think was probably president at he that time. He was president by then, yes. And so I was a CEO, and I was actually scheduled to be on a flight that morning at 11.30. So I was at the office uh, getting ready to head out to the airport. And I just remember Carol, my longtime wonderful assistant, saying, you know, I think your trip's in jeopardy. I said, well, you know, it, it was a fluke when the first plane hit. It wasn't a fluke when the second plane hit. And Mark Harwell, in some, he just had a, a sixth sense about certain things, computers as well as uh, people and, and culture and situations. He just huddled everybody up and said, this is a big deal. We were, all the people in the company were in the, uh, uh, you know, huddled up in the boardroom and other places where there were some TVs to tune in to what was going on. And it was very sketchy at first, but it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to Pebble Beach for a <laughs> golf vacation. Uh, if I, if it had been the day before, I'd be stranded there, which would be a good place to be stranded, not to make too light of that. But so I was stranded in Dallas, but I basically was, was probably more needed in Dallas. I think it was a very destabilizing event, not so much for our company, but uh, everything was at a standstill. We we published magazines. Those magazines were stuck on the tarmac or were not being distributed or people were not able to uh, uh, travel as freely uh, by plane and, and a lot of other things were gridlocked. And so we, we were stuck. And so our, our dealers, our collectors out there, it just Everything was at a standstill. The good news is I don't remember anybody ever complaining about that that particular issue because I think they all understood that those were... That we were late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But we had a good reason. Yeah. And just speaking to Carol, I saw a Facebook post from her the other day. She and her husband are happily retired and they're living in Arkansas and they're doing very well in retirement. And I'm glad that they've found their forever home at this point. I am too. Boy, this was, uh, again, with... Uh, with a, a an executive assistant who's running interference for you and doing a lot more. This is not shouldn't break into an episode of tribute to Carol, who's still very much alive. But she kind of uh, uh, anticipated things. And Mark did that too. So I'm sitting there, Mister Analytical, trying to figure out all the odds of all this stuff happening, and they're just very practically saying, "Look, we need to 
give the employees a chance to breathe, uh, to be able to contact uh, their their family and friends. And so we basically shut down pretty much. Well, we completely shut down for that day, uh, not expecting any work to get done. Maybe a little bit got done the rest of the week, but again, we were just backed up. Well, I was talking about Teddy Straka's yeah. wedding. Well, Teddy and his wife actually had two plane options to go on their honeymoon, one of which was Flight 93. Oh, boy. And he told me that about, because I, by the time it got settled, everything got settled, I finally called him on Saturday just to check in. And he said, yeah, by the way, our other flight is on flight, was on flight 93. We actually had a fight because it was too early in the morning. So he actually... He lost the fight. He lost the fight. A, a really good start to your marriage to lose the fight to your new wife. And save your life at the and, same time. And save your life. And pre- not save your marriage, but it's... it's uh, uh, t- to me, that's my new strategy. I'm going to lose every battle, and I'm going to I'm going to totally win in the end with my awesome wife. Uh, would you remember traveling before? I mean, we did a lot of show we a, travel, we actually, and it was so smooth. And you could take an earlier flight, you could meet people at the gate, and do all these things. And it was fun to travel, and then it wasn't fun anymore standing in line. We suspended all travel till the, at least the end of the year. I think the next show trip I went on was the following year's national. I didn't go on any trips until 2002. And that was actually fairly wow, normal. Yeah. We weren't traveling. We wanted to sort out everything. So, Well, when you came, my recollection is that most of us on the Price Guide team traveled about once a month. During the peak years of the early and mid-90s, that's what we did. The key people traveled. That was about, you. That was me. That, that was, was Grant. That was Theo. Yeah, that uh, was. We all traveled about once a month. That was Al Muir. That was Steve Judd when he was traveling. Right. We, and we all liked it because we got to talk to the dealers. We got to do yeah. relationships. And to me, building the relationships was always the key. Well, you uh, kind of had dibs on East Coast. Right, but so, so, did, Mike, were, but so did Mike Hirsch. And Mike Hirsch, too, but Grant had a West Coast uh, yeah. dibs. But, but while that meant is at 9-11 and other kinds of things, you were, you were going back to New York, New Jersey. I, I remember from my, some of my, you know, I'm uh, platinum for life with American Airlines, so I basically flew an awful lot for many, many years. But New York... As you said, I went to New York a lot. I went to Boston uh, once a year or twice a year over the years. I, and, I, and before that, when, in my expert witnessing career, I was in D.C. all the time. I was in the Pentagon all the time. And so I'm thinking, you know, I went to go see Tops lots. And they, they were down there near the World uh, Trade Towers. Yeah, and I remember I only went to Tops once when I was working for Beckett was in 1994. They were in the... They, they were, were way far. down. They, they were, were way downtown. They were way, way downtown. They were by the where you go to take the ferry for the Statue right. of Liberty, or but not far. You could walk to the ferry from where their office was. Yeah, but you could walk to the Twin Towers. too. You could walk to the Twin Towers. I did that on one trip. Yeah, and we, frankly, you know, like everybody else, at times we were having issues with Tops or with other companies. And really? Yeah, every once in a kidding. while we had trouble. <laughs> and basically, I was actually on a vacation, but my trip was as much to see yeah. how much I could soothe the relationship. And thankfully, it got back on gear at that point. Well, Tops I'm not had saying, different ownership structures over right. the years, and uh, again, a proud and and uh, excellent brand, but uh, different. Leadership and they, they brought in people from other industries sometimes to have new initiatives. And, and uh, like I always say in our company, mo- most of those things worked, but not everything. And top, same thing. They went through some ups and downs, but mostly ups. You know, and I talk about baseball cards saving my life. Well, in a weird way, they did. Because as I mentioned to you before we taped this, I was supposed to go to Tuesday night parsimony show and take a 7 p.m. flight out of Newark Airport instead of an earlier flight. You know? Well, by seven o'clock, I was holed up for the night somewhere in Virginia on. At some hotel just so I could drive for the next two days. That's a 22-hour drive by yourself for three days. I was calling Dan and Grant every four or five hours just saying, hey, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. It's okay. Well, we had concern about people that were either visiting New York or anywhere in the area, I mean, especially I was, that morning. I was the only one visiting New York. And then we also had a nice man by the name of John Kelly who was visiting yeah. Upper Deck in San Diego. It took him a few days to get back home, too. They figured out a way to get him a car to get back home. And, you know, I listened to... POTUS on Sirius XM, Politics of the United States, and there's a host in the morning, 8 to 11, named Michael Smirkanish, and every year he does a 9-11 tribute show, and they're starting to have debate is, you know, do we really want to do it every year? And I think our conversation shows that as long as people remember 9-11, to do shows like that, to talk about it, remains very important. Well, it was, uh, it was a, 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 a time in history that you can look back and say things were different before. They'll, they'll never be the same. And it I, makes me sad that, that uh, people have uh, distrust of people who are not like them in some way. Uh, in, uh, I'm hoping that hobbies and 
sports card collecting and things like that can be a great equalizer and great opportunity for people from different walks of life, different uh, uh, races, religions, uh, parts of the world can enjoy uh, the sport and the collecting uh, together and, and work things out. And I think it is to some extent. There's a dealer in the area, and our politics are diametrically different. And one day on Facebook, we were having a discussion on which hosts you can listen to on his favorite network or my favorite network, and we were going back and forth. And some people started interfering in the Facebook conversation, and we both basically said, no, this is, we do this all the time. You stay out of this. You stay out of this conversation. We stay friends this way. <laughs> is, is that the guy I met? No, that's not. Uh, that's, that's, that's so you have apparently have a bunch of friends that are that come at things a little bit differently. I actually have a number of friends who vote very differently than I vote, but I find that I we can agree on what needs to be done, but not on how to get it done. Exactly. I and mean, uh, that there, here's a problem, the solution, we, we would sometimes diametrically differ on that, but, but we agree that there's a problem and something needs to be done. And I was very impressed when you met Representative Strickland at the show, yeah. and you were able to talk to him on, oh, I play golf with this person, yeah. with this person, and yeah. oh, this daughter on the blaze is yeah. really good. And, you know, it was fun to hear that conversation. I just stayed out of the way and let the two of you talk. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, but he's a passion. He's a typical car yeah. collector. He's come back. He read Beckett in the 80s and 90s and is coming back and he enjoys it. He's a big Pudge fan. And he's, you know, we agreed on a lot of what we did. It's, as you said, it's how it gets there is a little bit different, but we actually agreed on a lot of stuff. Well, the one of the big differences between Republicans and Democrats is about regulating things. And, my, and I don't know that in the card collecting world, people want a lot of regulation Unless they get burned. <laughs> right. And, you know, I'll leave you with this. My wife's friends own daycares. They've now sold them for like 25 years. You know, no real complaints. They did a wonderful job with them. But they had to fill out the class sizes by hand and submit handwritten class sizes to the state. You know, one of the things I said, why couldn't you just send it in on a computer? You have 25 years. Why do they have to read it? Don't they trust you after 25 years with no, no outstanding complaints? <laughs> Um, folks, uh, we're not blaming that on 9-11. No, we're not. But uh, it, since 9-11, there's been a response to things. And some of that response is to really tighten up. And uh, some of that tightening up is probably appropriate, but uh, some of it seems uh, like it's put situations at a, at a, at a standstill. And uh, to strike the right balance, uh, everybody wants to be safe. We want to just like with the uh, card collecting industry, we want to have safe trades. We don't want to get burned, but, you know, we need safeguards. We need double checks. We need people that are looking out for cleaning up and uh, protecting us from uh, the occasional bad apple. So uh, any last thoughts about uh, 9-11, Rich? I'm was... glad you weren't on an earlier flight. So I'm was I. I'm glad, glad I wasn't Teddy. going the and opposite I'm, direction. And I'm glad Teddy wasn't on Flight 93. And Teddy on Flight 93, which was the Todd Beamer flight, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah and so I'm glad he wasn't amazing. on that flight. And I'm glad that, you know, mercifully, with, you know, with all the people I knew, I was tangentially touched, but I thankfully didn't lose anybody I knew on 9-11, which, I'm, which I feel very blessed about. And uh, let's end on a high note. I eventually did go to Pebble Beach and really enjoyed playing those great courses out there. So I am retired now, so I can play golf uh, a little bit here and there, and that's certainly a great place. But uh, my place on 9-11 of 2001 was uh, with my company and with my friends and family. So, again, thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks, Rich, for uh, reminiscing of the then and now 9-11, and we will uh, be back tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you.